realize that there's a little bit of a shift in the typical lighting of my videos, but it is so hot today. It nearly got to 100 degrees today, so it is very warm in this house. We do not have air conditioning. For some reason, this house was not built to withstand the heat. I'm, I'm definitely struggling today. That's why I don't have the overhead light on and it looks a little bit different, but we are going to embrace that. It's October. It's October in California. That's all I'm going to say. So today we are obviously going to be doing my September wrap up. I'm so excited to talk about these books because not only did I end up reading like seven books this month, it was also the beginning of Latina Heritage Month, which is awesome. And I read so many Latina books. In September, I didn't even know what a slump was, honestly. And I'm so sorry if I sound weird. For some reason, I'm losing my voice today. So we're going to try to make this quick and we're going to try to not like spend too much time on each book, but I did really want to talk about these ones, especially since I read two books that have been on my physical TBR for so long and just on my TBR in general for so long. So we are going to get right on into them. And the first book that I ended up reading in September was Happy Hour by Marlo Granados, which is a book that I have been wanting to read for so, so long. I actually picked up this copy, I believe was it my first time going to New York or my second time? It might have been my second time, but I can't quite remember. Um, but I did buy this in New York, actually on Long Island, <laughs> but I think that that's still really fitting because this book takes place in New York. It's about these two young women in their 20s and they are spending the summer in New York and they are both from Canada and they don't have work visas. So they're just kind of doing a bunch of odd jobs, things that they don't really need to do a lot of paperwork for, don't really need to be on the record, getting paid under the table, getting help from a lot of friends and it really just reads like a diary of this main character and she is like the coolest girl that you will ever meet. She is so interesting and fun and different and has all of these like little thoughts that she talks about in this book and I'm just like you are the coolest person ever. I want to be you. I wish that I was you. Can I be you when I grow up? It's not very plot driven so you're not going to get a lot of that sort of substance but it is so character driven and I absolutely loved reading about all these characters because they are so different and unique and have such strong voices. I feel like it's a grown up gossip girl in a way so if you really enjoyed those books and you are now in your 20s I would highly highly recommend this one. The next book that I ended up reading was another one that has been on my TBR for so long and that is Catherine House by Elizabeth Thomas and I did talk a lot about this book in my previous vlog so I will link that down below but this is one that left me a little bit like I don't know how to rate this I don't really know how to process what I just read it's very very strange and I think that that is what trips up a lot of people when it comes to whether they enjoyed this book or not um especially from reading a lot of the reviews it was kind of like I got the sense of people feeling as though they couldn't really get a grasp on the writing style and the like what this author is trying to portray. I will say that I feel like the writing style was really intentional with this book because it's describing something that is so outlandish and so weird and strange but doing so in such a normalized like casual simplistic way and I think that that juxtaposition is supposed to be jarring so I can see why it wouldn't work for everybody, but I do think that it was important to what this author was trying to say. And really this book kind of, at least for me, highlights a lot of the ridiculousness in the way that we value higher education and the lengths that people will go to in order to go into higher education and get that degree. Because basically Catherine House is a private university and in order to go there, you get a full ride scholarship. However, you have to stay there for three years. You don't get any summer breaks, no spring breaks, no winter breaks, nothing like that. You don't get to talk to your friends or family outside of the university. Um, you are completely cut off from the outside world. 
and at the end of it you get the degree and Catherine House is a really prestigious university. A lot of very important people are alumni and speak very highly of Catherine House once they're done with it and it makes it a very competitive school to get into. And it was really interesting because I read the audiobook for this one and at the end of the audiobook there was an excerpt from a podcast that the author had been a guest on and she kind of talked a little bit more about the book and I think that that's kind of what helped me understand what her intentions were and how I should be engaging with this book and actually made it a lot easier for me to understand like what I wanted to rate it. So I ended up giving it four out of five stars. I really enjoyed it. I thought that it was really well executed. There was definitely some things about like structure and plot and things like that. They weren't totally my favorite but I think it really just came down to like what I enjoy reading. But otherwise I do think that this was a really great book, really well executed, and I do highly recommend it. But I would say to go in with the correct like assumptions and know what you're getting into is just all I'll say. And then finally I got into the books that I was reading for Latina Heritage Month and the first one I ended up picking up was actually the group book for the Latinx book bingo readathon. And that one was Vampires of El Norte by Isabel Cañas, and I gave this one a four out of five stars. It's this really beautiful, like, historical romance that has just a sprinkling of vampires, and I think that that is kind of what trips up some people with this book. They kind of go into it thinking it's going to be more vampire centric and a bit more I mean I don't really have a lot of cultural like references to vampires. I don't typically like to read books about vampires. I don't really know why. They've just never been like a thing for me. Like the only book series I've ever read with vampires, at least that I can remember, is Twilight. I don't really have any like <laughs> way to describe this book in terms of comparisons. But I think that people just kind of went into it thinking it's going to be very obviously vampires, like kind of Twilight-esque, kind of Dracula-esque. Those are the only two cultural references I have, but it's not. I, the vampires in this book are really more of a social commentary. I mean, it's it's kind of in the title. It's The title in English is Vampires of the North, so we're really talking about colonization and the taking of resources by the the vampires from the north the vampires being colonizers which i think is something that you kind of i don't think you need to know before going into this book but i think that for a lot of people especially those who are not latine or are not like victims of colonization would not really get initially. Just from reviews that I've read of this book that just like did not get it, I think that that would be really useful information to know before going into this book. But at the heart of it, it really is a historical romance, which I really enjoyed. My only critique for this book that I just could not connect with was the female main character. I just felt like she wasn't fleshed out enough. I just didn't see enough characterization from her which was a bit of a bummer because I felt like the male main character was so fleshed out and so well characterized and I just really really enjoyed him as a character so I think that that was just sort of a disconnect for me. I would have liked to see more personality from her, get to see more depth from her, and I think that the romance would have worked even better if I had seen that. So. I just thought I'd put that out there because I I think that when it comes to romance you really do need to focus on characters and for me when I read a romance with one very strong character and one very weak character it doesn't land as well for me. But overall I did really enjoy this book and I thought it was a very sweet little love story. It's very like friends to lovers situation. They grew up together and I did also really like the commentary on colonization so I do highly recommend this book it just wasn't like my absolute favorite. The next book that I read for Latina Heritage Month was A Proposal They Can't Refuse by Natalie Kanya and I ended up giving this book five out of five stars. It was such a fun romance book. I I initially almost wasn't going to read this one either because I was like I don't know am I in the mood for romance you know what do I want and I'm so glad I ended up picking this book up. It's really hard for me to describe because it's not necessarily like a cut and dry like 
easy plot. It's very convoluted in my opinion, but I think that it kind of works. Like the execution of it is so perfect. Basically the two main characters of this book have known each other their entire lives because their grandfathers are BFFs and when they were younger they kind of went in on this one building and decided to share it. One side of the building is a brewery or I don't actually know is it a distillery? I'm not really sure what a manufacturer of whiskey is called. Is it a distillery? I'm not sure but one part is a distillery of whiskey and the other one is a Puerto Rican restaurant. These two main characters don't like each other. They used to be very good friends but something happened and they had a falling out and now they are not getting along. <laughs> However, both of their grandfathers kind of come up with this scheme to get them to get engaged and like <laughs> be together um, through basically blackmail. <laughs> and I feel like that's all you really need to know about this book. It's a lot of fun. It's really silly, but I also think that it's perfect for this time of year because it is set during the fall. They go to a pumpkin patch and I love that scene. It's so cute. Um, there are also a lot of steamy moments, so definitely keep that in mind if you're looking for that. I just, I thought this was such a cute book and both characters were so strong. Like they had the most distinctive voices and it was definitely very refreshing coming off of The Vampires of El Norte where I felt like it was a little bit uneven to this book where I'm like, oh, they are very equally matched characters and it was a lot of fun. So highly recommend this book. I feel like it doesn't get enough love. And I think that this is a book that so many people would absolutely go nuts for. It just isn't as popular, so. I highly recommend it. The next book is actually from an author that I read last year and I didn't absolutely love her book last year but I was really excited to see a new book from her and that is Little Eyes by Samantha Schweblin and this is a translated work of I don't I don't know if it'd be like speculative horror it, it's a little bit like literary fiction-esque. I found that this is kind of my preferred subgenre of horror that is a little bit speculative, a little bit literary fiction, and I love translated horror. It's so much fun. It's so different than, you know, the typical American horror books. I feel like they have a little bit more of like a social commentary aspect to them. But with Little Eyes, it definitely reminded me a lot of The Twilight Zone or Black Mirror. So if you like those shows, you might really love this one. And basically in this universe, I, I don't know if it's set in the f in the like near future or like in the present, but basically there is this sort of gadget that is like a stuffed animal that can move around, but it is also it also has like a camera and it can pick up on what the people around it are saying and it's almost like a pet, but on the other end is a person who controls that little animal. And these two people, the ones that own the animal and the ones that control the animal, don't know each other. They're on, like they can be on complete opposite sides of the world. And basically this book just follows like multiple people who either own the pet or control the pet and things ensue. It's, it gets a little weird and a little crazy and there is definitely that sort of horror aspect to it. It's not necessarily scary, and that's what I kind of like about these type of books is that they're not like, it's not like ghosts are gonna haunt you. It's, <laughs> it's very much like social commentary on the ways that we engage with our phones and social media and surveillance and stuff like that. So I highly recommend this book. I gave it four out of five stars. I actually really loved this one. I read Fever Dream from her last year for Latina Heritage Month and I didn't love that one quite as much as I love Little Eyes. So I highly recommend this one over Fever Dream, personally. The second to last book that I read was actually not for Latina Heritage Month, and that is Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. This is one that I actually ended up DNFing somewhere around like the 60 to 65% mark, so I did want to talk about it in this video. I unfortunately just did not connect with this book. I was really hoping that I would. I was really excited about this one, but at the end of the day, I just did not connect with it and I wasn't really seeing what other people are seeing about this book. 
I am kind of interested though in watching some like reviews of this one or maybe like looking at the Goodreads reviews because I just don't really get it I guess like I, I don't really understand the hype with this book I have personally preferred other Rebecca Ross books in the past like I still think that her best book is The Queen's Rising and it never gets any love which I think is absolutely criminal um, I don't know why the book talk girlies haven't picked up The Queen's Rising because they love Divine Rivals, they love A River Enchanted, um, but for some reason nobody's picking up The Queen's Rising, which I think is an incredible duology and so much fun and such a great fantasy book, but alas, I don't control book talk, but I just, I didn't love this one, unfortunately. I liked the first, like, I'd say 15 to 20% of it. But by the time we got around to like the midway point, I just wasn't loving it anymore. Um, I think I, I, I told a couple of people that I'm like, I think I just really enjoyed getting to watch them bicker at the newspaper. Like that was fun for me. The whole like going into the war and reporting on it kind of lost me a little bit. Not that I don't like books about war, not that I don't like those kind of fantasies, which I do, it's just that's not what I really wanted from this book, I guess. So really it's just a personal thing. It's it's on me. It's not really on the book. I just, I couldn't connect with it. And the very last book that I read for Latina Heritage Month and the last book that I read of the month was The Worst Best Man by Mia Sosa, which is a book that I have been putting off for years. And then I actually attempted to read it earlier this year and kind of like tentatively DNF'd it and was like, I don't know if this book is really for me. I don't know if it's my vibe. I just wasn't really into it. But then I decided to pick it up again and restart it. And I feel like this time around, it just connected with me so much more. And I really, really enjoyed it. I ended up giving it four out of five stars. It was really close to getting that five out of five stars, but I felt like it just didn't have that last little element to really push it into a favorite of mine. I did really enjoy this one. Basically, it's about this young woman and she was left at the altar. And then she ends up becoming a wedding planner and ends up having to work with the brother of the man that stood her up at her wedding. I feel like that's the most I can condense this plot into, but it is so much fun. And I just, I love these stories where two characters unwittingly and kind of not like against their will, but like, just like they don't really like each other and they don't really want to hang out with each other, but they have to. I love that. That sort of like forced proximity is just one of my favorite tropes and I love it. And I think that it's something that I didn't really realize that I loved, but I do. But yeah, I really, really enjoyed this book. I thought it was so much fun, so funny, so fresh. I could totally see this book being a movie. I do have the second book in this series from Hoopla, but I don't know if I'm gonna get to it anytime soon because I'm not quite in like the romance mood at the moment. I'm very much in my like autumnal era. So we'll see, we'll see if I get to it, but I did really enjoy this book and I highly recommend it. All right, so that was my entire September wrap up. I read so many fun books. I feel like there wasn't really a book that I absolutely hated this month besides Divine Rivals but even then it wasn't like I, I hate this book it was just kind of like I don't feel anything towards this book so I'm not counting that but otherwise I had an incredible reading month it's just so much fun so many cool and exciting books that I just was so grateful to read <laughs> I'm glad that I picked them out and I highly recommend most of them besides Divine Rivals, but I mean, you can make your own decisions with that book. In the comments down below, let me know some of the books that you read in September that you really loved. I always need recommendations. And if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also go ahead and follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Goodreads, Storygraph, TikTok. All the links are down below and I will see you all in my next video. Bye. Ooh, I